So the first point, whenever someone uh, gave you an ECG, first thing I would like to say is that you don't need to panic. First point anyone will ask if uh, you were given an ECG is heart rate. So whenever an ECG is given and you are asked a heart rate and we will be calculating it as 300 by the number of boxes which we have in between two RR waves. Uh, here I have drawn it as four. So obviously we will be saying 75 and that is simple. But my question is here, did any one of you think why we are taking only 300 and not 500? Uh, that's where the basic uh, comes into action so we have to know a uh, few basics which are very very important how much time it will take for one ECG strip to come out of the ECG machine 10 seconds for an entire whole ECG strip to come out 10 seconds and if you take the entire ECG strip and if you count the total number of uh, large boxes in the 10 second ECG strip there will be 50 boxes we have to calculate the heart rate for one minute which is 60 seconds so obviously we'll be getting how many boxes 50 into 6 is equal to 300 boxes that's where this 300 has come then there is a second method how we can calculate 1500 by number of small boxes again where does this 1500 come so let me take one large box in that large box we can clearly see five small boxes 300 large boxes will have 1500 small boxes so that's where this 1500 has come these two methods will apply only an ECG which is having a regular rhythm if the number of large boxes are same in the entire ECG strip then we call it as regular rhythm if we are having two boxes between two RRs or three boxes between two RRs or if five or six boxes between two RRs, then we call it as irregular rhythm. So in a need to count the total number of R waves, so multiply with six you may ask why we have to multiply with six because total number of r waves we are getting in a uh, ecg strip is just for 10 seconds so if we have to get it for 60 seconds then we have to multiply it with six that's when we get 72 just calculate the heart rate from this uh, ecg so from this we can clearly see that between two rrs the number of large boxes are four uh, this ecg is a regular rhythm ecg 300 by total number of large boxes that is four so 75 will be the heart rate 10 100 by 20 you will almost get to 75 again you may ask uh, can't we apply third method that is uh, number of r waves into six in this uh, normal regular rhythm ecg yes we can apply 12 are there 12 into 6 we almost get 72 which can be more precise heart rate of this particular ECG. now we'll calculate heart rate in this particular ecg this ecg is an irregular rhythm ECG. we need to find the heart rate from this irregular number uh, irregular rhythm ecg then definitely we know the third method which is nothing but uh, counting the number of hours and we can multiply with the six so 21 into six that is nothing but 126 per minute will be your heart rate for this particular ECG which is irregular rhythm ECG. So next we'll be moving on to conduction system of the heart. So generally whenever you're looking into the conduction system of the heart, uh, first point we have to know, let me tell you the resting membrane potential of a cardiac myocyte will be minus 90 mV and this will be completely dependent on one ion which is very very important that is nothing but potassium. Whenever there is a conduction wave is moving towards the electrode, we will get a positive wave. And when it is moving away from the electrode, we'll be getting a negative wave. So we have an SA node here. We have an AV node here. Then we have AV bundle, bundle of his right bundle branch, left bundle branch, Purkinje fibers. So this is what the conduction pathway of a normal heart. SA node has a property called as an automatic signal. So when the SA node is getting activated, current moves along uh, the atria and activates the AV node. Now AV node will stimulate the AV bundle, then AV bundle will the current to bundle of his and bundle of his to ventricles via Purkinje fibers. So depolarization wave moves in a direction called from endocardium to pericardium. Now what happens is that repolarization wave will move in the opposite direction obviously. So this is my repolarization wave and this is my depolarization wave. The positive current, the depolarization current is called as a positive current. The positive current is moving towards positive then definitely we get a positive deflection on the ECG. The negative current is moving away from the positive electrode, which is again a positive. If we are positive and if a positive thing is moving towards, we always be benefit. Even in the same way, if a negative thing is moving away from us, then definitely we will be benefit. But if a negative thing is moving towards neg negative, then definitely we will get negative deflection again. That means if the negative current, that is repolarization current, is moving towards the positive electrode, we get a negative. Deflection. That is the reason we get a 
wave, a positive wave, QRS, a positive wave, T wave, which is a repolarization wave and a negative current, but a positive wave because of this logic. So now I will tell you the lead placement of the heart. So we'll have a right arm, we have a left arm. So the negative electrode will push the current towards the left arm, which is having a positive electrode here. So which is the first lead, right arm and an electrode towards left leg, which is a lead two again, which is having a positive electrode here and the left arm sending current to left leg and we also have three other leads AVF, AVR, AVL. Right leg is a neutral. AVL is nothing but an left and I will be neutralizing the right arm and the left leg and I will get AV and this will be AVR and I will be having AVF. So these will be the six limb leads that is AVL, AVR, AVF and one, two, three. The placement of these chest leads will be V1, V2, V3, V4, V5 and V6. So V1 and V2 will be the septal leads, V3 and V4 anterior leads which is looking at the anterior chest wall and we have V5 and V6 which are lateral leads which are looking onto the lateral side of the heart, the axis of the heart. Normally we study as minus 32 plus 90 degrees is called as normal axis. Why? only minus 32 plus 90 is called as normal axis. So this is the normal axis of the heart. As we have already discussed that the current is moving towards the positive electrode and it is moving from endocardium to pericardium. That's why we take it as the normal axis is between minus 32 plus 90. That's the reason. The leads which are present in the normal axis are AVL 1 to AVF. In the normal axis leads, all the waves will, I mean the waves will be positive. The leads which are present outside the axis, that is nothing but number three and AVR negative deviation or negative. Learn the method of axis calculation R minus S in one and AVR. So you have to calculate the R minus S in any of the two perpendicular leads and if you take the perpendicular leads as one and AVF calculate the total number of uh, small boxes R wave has progressed in lead one and S wave has progressed in lead uh, in the lead one then uh, R minus S that is seven boxes here and two boxes here seven minus two will get five in the same way do the same thing for the AVF and you calculate the same R minus S and you get six minus zero you got plus six you take as uh, x axis and y axis and mark it mark the plus five on x and uh, plus six on y then you have to point the common point here and the common point should be within the normal axis only somewhere here the point we have calculated has fallen somewhere here it is outside minus 30 but towards left side so we say left axis deviation so if the point is fallen here somewhere here so it is outside the axis again but towards the right side so we say right axis deviation so if the point uh, has fallen here outside the axis but extremely right side we say extreme right axis deviation with the uh, help of axis we can know direction of the current that is moving in the heart so if the heart muscle is more on the right side uh, more power or more amount of current will move towards the right and we get a right axis that's called right ventricular hypertrophy. Even in the same way, whenever there is a left ventricular hypertrophy, we can see a left axis deviation. Arteries are supplying which leads is the question again. So generally we have a right coronary artery which is supplying to SA node, which is supplying to AV node, right atrium, right ventricle and posterior one third of the ventricle sept. And we have a left anterior descending artery which is a branch of left coronary artery that is supplying to the anterior part of the heart or right. and the same LAD also supplies to anterior two-thirds interventricular septum. LCX will be supplying to that is left circumflex artery which is also supplying to the lateral part of the heart right lateral part of the heart and sometimes it will also contribute for the anterior two-thirds of uh, interventricular septum. If it is coming from LCX we can say it is left dominant. If it is coming from RCA we can say it is a right dominant artery and this posterior descending artery is supplying the inferior most part of the heart. So V1, V2, V3, V4 is supplied by LAD. If there is a block in the left anterior descending artery, anterior part of the heart will be gone and that we call it as anterior wall MI and this lateral part is being supplied by the lateral circumflex. So whenever there is a block in this left circumflex or the lateral circumflex, lateral wall MI. So these two, three AVF are looking at the inferior part of the heart and who is being supplied by both RCA and also posterior descending artery and whenever there is a block in the RCA, we will be having the classical inferior wall 
EMI. And here, one more interesting point I would like to add is that RCA, whenever there is block in this RCA, definitely SA node will be uh, inhibited and AV node will be inhibited. That's why whenever a patient who is having inferior wall MI, inferior wall MI comes, the patient presents with bradycardia because SA node is not functioning properly. AV node is not functioning properly due to the lack of, due to lack of blood supply. And due to bradycardia, the patient goes into hypotension and he collapses inferior wall MI patients having cardiac arrest. A lady that is uh, being blocked and anterior wall MI is uh, developed immediately Immediately, sympathetic nervous system will be activated and whenever the sympathetic nervous system is activated, heart rate increases, BP increases in the patient and which is actually a compensatory mechanism. Lee we will be talking about is the waves. So this is a normal ECG wave. So the representation of P wave is nothing but atrial depolarization. As I said, depolarization and it is nothing but a positive current. We have a positive deflection here. This is very, very important. This is nothing but the SA nodal action potential. So I have written 403 on this particular SA nodal action potential. Phase 4. 4 is nothing but a slow sodium depolarization. Phase 0 which is a calcium rapid depolarization. Then we have 3 which is nothing but potassium repolarization of atrium. The P wave which we are seeing here 70% of the P wave belongs to right atrium and only 30% of the P wave belongs to left atrium. In late V1, you will see the same P wave in different manner. Upper part of the P wave belongs to right atrium and the lower part belongs to left atrium. This is right atrium and this is, this clearly indicates pressure increase in the left atrium. So what was one condition, a common and very important condition that you can remember where there will be massive increase in the pressure in the left atrium and there will be this kind of wave in lead 2 that is nothing but mitral stenosis. So in mitral stenosis whenever there is a very narrow orifice the blood flow from left atrium to uh, left ventricle will be very difficultly moving and this resulted in increase in a lot of pressure in the left atrium this resulted in uh, getting a wave due to increased pressure a wave that is separating from the right atrium part of the p wave and we get a broad p wave and which is looking like an m this kind of abnormal p wave is called as p my trail this is my p wave which is very much taller than my normal p wave which i could look in the lead to which is my standard lead a normal that only 30 percent but the right atrial part has become so large and very tall something is going on in the right atrium is nothing but increase in the right atrial pressures but one common condition where we can clearly see there is a massive increase in the right atrial uh, pressure is core pulmonary increase in the pulmonary pressure there will be increased pressure in the right ventricle so this right ventricle pressure will be moving on to the left, uh, right atrium and the right atrial pressure will result in large p wave which we can see in core pulmonary is called as p pulmonary as we have discussed the sa nodal action potential which is being dependent on sodium calcium and also potassium so whenever there are abnormalities in sodium and uh, calcium and potassium levels in the body then definitely there will be a change in the p wave that means if there is a uh, for example if there is hypocalcemia the p wave will be smaller whenever there is uh, hypercalcemia the uh, P waves will be coming faster and P waves will be taller. The same way that applies to the uh, hyponatremia, hypernatremia, even for the hyperkalemia and hypokalemia. QRS. So what does this QRS represent? Yes, obviously ventricular repolarization. QRS wave has a representation of AV nodal or ventricular action potential. The resting one is potassium and this is the sodium upright one. And we have inward K plus rectifiers. Then we have calcium channels. Then we have potassium channels again here. So this exact synchronized with the QRS. Let me draw the QRS and its synchronization of the ventricular action potential and the respective electrolyte channels and the ventricular repolarization and atrial repolarization as well. So this is very clear that sodium and calcium are responsible for this ventricular depolarization and potassium is responsible for the T wave, which is called as atrial, re atrial repolarization and the PR segment which we have here is also responsible for the potassium. With this action potential, what if there is a hypernatremia or hypercalcemia, then definitely we can say 
we will be getting narrow pures if there is a hyponatremia right or hypocalcemia we can clearly say we will be getting broad qrs obviously so whenever there is hyperkalemia tall t waves whenever you are having hypokalemia we will be getting flat t wave or inverted t waves that if just the basic differentiation you could find it is that in a hyperkalemia patient the t wave should be more than two and a half large boxes otherwise if it is less than two boxes and it is tall then definitely it is emi t wave is atrial repolarization u wave is also repolarization wave but from the purkinje fiber repolarization due to purkinje fibers so here we can clearly see in v1 we have a r and we have an s and we have in a v6 we have a q and we have and r the small r which you are seeing is representing the right ventricle the s which you are seeing is representing the left ventricle q you are seeing here representing the right ventricle and the r you are seeing is nothing but the left ventricle there is a right ventricular hypertrophy we can clearly see in v1 there will be tall r wave when compared to the s and deep q wave when compared to the r in the v6 even if we have a left ventricular hypertrophy and v1 we can clearly see more taller s wave than the r and in v6 we can clearly see the taller r wave as you can clearly see so this is what the use of we looking into uh, v1 and v6 with regards to know whether there is a left ventricular or right ventricular hypertrophy which should be very very useful so in v1 yes part of the v1 plus r part of the v6 should be more than 35 mm so this will be the uh, ventricular hypertrophy that is left ventricular hypertrophy. so next the very interesting part has come 